So you've been arrested, you were a waitress at a strip club, and you found yourself on the verge of bankruptcy. Yet you went on to build one of the largest makeup brands in the world and selling it for $1.2 billion. You made Forbes list of America's richest self-made women and you end up marrying the love of your life. So what lies do we believe are holding us women back from feeling worthy enough to change and achieve our dreams just like you did? When we have low self-worth, it can still look like everything's great on the outside, right? There are people that are crushing it in every area of life and they are not fulfilled and they don't know why, or they're really unhappy or they don't believe they're worthy of things and they don't know why, Mm. and they're still just striving to be enough. So when we have low self-worth, what it looks like is we feel stuck and we don't know why. We believe that we are smart and have all this skill set and we maybe have worked really, really hard. We've studied all this stuff, but we're stuck. We feel stuck and we're not going for it and we don't know why. And that's how self-worth will show up in our lives. And it could be in your career. It could be that you are an artist and you write poetry or you paint and you still haven't shared it with the world and you don't know why. It could look like You have an amazing idea and you've been developing a plan to launch a business around it, but you keep spending eight hours a day scrolling Instagram and you don't know why. And you're procrastinating and you don't know why. When we don't believe we are worthy of something, we will find a way to stay stuck and to not go for it at all, Mm -hmm. which is why building self-worth is so important. Now, there's a lot of us that have medium level self-worth, right? Medium or even medium high. What that looks like is We go for things, we go for them, like we go for them, but then we'll sabotage them along the way or we'll hit a plateau. We'll build our business to be six figures or seven figures and we, and we hit a plateau and, and, and we don't realize it's because we actually at an identity level don't believe we're worthy of going above that. We'll be a CEO crushing it and hitting numbers in our company, but we won't share our real ideas that could take it to the next level because we don't want to take a risk because we don't quite feel worthy of it. Like that's what that looks like. And then a lot of us that have medium to high self-worth, right? What that looks like is I keep achieving everything, but I still don't feel I'm enough. I still miss fulfillment. I still feel like something's missing. So I'm just going to keep hustling, working harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. You and I are people that have so many dreams and goals and huge ambitions. And a lot of our friends do, a lot of our people we've been so blessed to meet do. One of the biggest lies, Kay, and I want to just tackle this real fast, people have is, oh, if I feel like I'm enough as I am and I'm fully worthy as I am, which you are, but if I feel I'm fully worthy as I am, maybe I'll lose my ambition and maybe I'll lose my drive. I don't want that. I like feeling like I'm never enough, so I work harder and harder. It is the biggest lie. When you feel fully worthy exactly as you are, it does not kill your ambition. It actually fuels it because now you're no longer, you don't worry anymore if you, if you fail because you know it's not tied to your self-worth. You know you are rock solid enough as you are. So you actually, when you have strong self-worth, you actually take more risks. You actually have more ambition. The difference is when you achieve those things and when you, you know, serve and give and create uh, and offer everything that's in your soul to the world, you're actually fulfilled when you do it because you feel deep down inside enough is who you are. Whether you're someone who is stuck and you don't know why, or you're someone who's crushing the world's definition of success and you don't know why you're not fulfilled and you don't know why you still feel like it's not enough or you're not enough, it's almost always because of self-worth and learning how to raise that underneath it all. Literally, I was going to ask you because I have like these two sides to me. One where it's like, I love the idea of you being perfect just the way you are. Like the, ah, the amount of like things you can let go of, all the stress and the worry of, am I pretty enough? Am I, do I look good enough? Am I smart enough? All of that, right? It, it, I understand it. Like it really does allow you to let go. But then the other side that if you're enough and you're smart enough and everything, what does propel you to go for more? What does then propel you to improve, to build better skill sets? I'm not even going to say to achieve higher things. I'm just going to say to build better skill sets in whatever. Um, And you just answered it because that's the disconnect sometimes that I think about and I worry about in myself that if I think that, no, Lisa, you're perfect the way you are, then I won't keep going. And so I kind of, I I liken it to, um, like I just have like these dual people in my head and I've got like the one voice in my head that's like I love you Lisa you're good enough and I go come on what the fuck are you doing 
brain, you know, on the yeah. other side of yeah. my brain yeah. screaming at and me. And you need both. This mm-hmm. is the thing you need both for fulfillment, right? To feel you are enough, worthy of love and belonging exactly mm-hmm. as you are. And also to be growing and building self-confidence and contributing mm-hmm. for ultimate fulfillment. You need all that. And the biggest challenge is that most people only do the stuff where they're growing and building confidence, but underneath they don't feel enough as they are. Mm. And that's when you can do all of it and never feel fulfilled and not know why. How many people have six pack abs, have business that are crushing it, have, they're doing all the things, they're in the cover of magazines, they have 50 billion followers, and they still don't feel enough, right? So they're actually not able to enjoy mm. any of the stuff that they're doing or to feel fulfillment, you know? So that's like the one thing is building that that sense of worthiness, that you are enough exactly as you are, and you're worthy of love and belonging exactly as you are. You're able to then enjoy it. And and you also know, you know what? If I put myself out there and I fall flat on my my face, you know, it might hurt my confidence, but doesn't hurt my worth. Dude, that's so strong. I mean, I wrote a whole book about confidence yeah. and it never really, like I would, I said in the book multiple times, like confidence is a muscle. It, it like, you have to build it and yes. then also it can ebb and flow. It's not like yes. you always have the confidence. And so when I read yes. your book and that worthy piece, I was like, oh my God, that's the underlying, the foundation to then be able to build your confidence. But if you yes. don't actually believe in yourself and have the worth, then you're not going to go for it. Because let's say you believe, you've started uh, It Cosmetics, right? Yeah. And you've gone out and you've had a million rejections, but you've got one that you actually think the deal is going to come through. Yes. So you spent three years, you and your husband, like saving every penny, building the company, company really sacrificing and then you um you go to this one guy and you think the deal is done the dreams come true and if you don't mind sharing that story of what he says to you because this goes to that moment again i i am obsessed with this movie sliding doors have you ever seen it with gwyneth paltrow so it's a my audience heard me speak about a thousand times but it's a story where she's about to board the underground the tube and she makes the tube And then it cuts to a moment and it repeats where she's running for the underground and she doesn't make the Mm. tube. And these are the two paths. And you literally throughout the whole movie see her life going in completely opposite Mm. directions just by making the door or not making the door. And when I think about the story that you're about to share, that moment of these two paths where it's like one leads you to selling it to L'Oreal for 1.2 billion and the other one leaves you on the floor crying and never making anything of yourself. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the moments that define our destiny, right? And how we handle those moments, right? It's how we handle those Mm -hmm. moments. And, you know, uh, so the one particular rejection that you're talking about, the story out of thousands of rejections, by the way, anybody today right now who's feeling rejected or like they're facing setbacks or any of those things, like they are never an indication of your potential for success. Mm -hmm. They are not. And the key is to never let anyone else's doubts about you turn into doubts about yourself in your own head. That is everything. Like how we handle those moments, it's not if they're gonna happen or not, it's how we handle them, right? And like, what are the tools in our toolbox to pull out and decide how we're gonna handle those moments can change everything, right? And so uh, in this one example, we had faced, oh my gosh, years of rejection. We were down to no money. I didn't know how we were gonna make it as a company. Everyone kept saying no and that they didn't think the business was going to work and all this. And uh, I finally got a meeting with a potential investor who's really well-known private equity company. Uh, They're very famous for taking like a lot of small unknown brands, turning them into these big companies that all of us shop for in the grocery store or big box retailers or whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, if they invest in us, because they got a hold of our product and really liked it. I was like, if they invest in us, like... It's going to be life-changing. Like, A, we're not going to go bankrupt. B, maybe they can use their power to get me into all these retail stores that keep telling me no. Like, all this stuff, right? I was like, this is huge. And so we started taking meetings and meeting after meeting after meeting. It got to the final meeting. We had lawyers involved. We were in the diligence phase, which meant they were going to acquire the business or, or invest a big stake. And it got down to the final meeting where I was presenting the whole product pipeline. And at the very end of the meeting, like I thought this was going to be the moment, like my saving grace, Mm -hmm. right? And the head guy was about three feet from me. uh, And then his whole team was behind him and they were awesome. Uh, And he says to me, like, congratulations, you should be so proud. This is a really, really great product, but we've decided it's a no. Uh, We're going to pass on investing in It Cosmetics. Now, this was years of hundreds and hundreds of no's in. I was hoping this would be the one. And he says that to me. And I say, 
okay, um, can you tell me why? Because feedback is usually a gift. Um, and I said, can you tell me why? And he just got really quiet and he's standing about three feet from me. And he says, do you want me to be really honest with you? And I was like, yes, please. And then he just paused for the longest time. And I remember I started feeling my heart beat in my ears because like, I didn't know what he was going to say. And then he says these words to me. I remember the moment his mouth started opening and he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. And when he said those words to me, I actually never felt any anger toward him. But what happened instantly was like a lifetime of self-doubt and body doubt, like flooded my body all at once. So I actually felt when he was saying these words, like I was staring my own fear straight in the eye. But the moment he said those words, I got this feeling deep down inside. I'll never forget this feeling in my gut, like my knowing, right? Not my head. My head was like lifetime of self-doubt, body doubt. I'm not enough. All that, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment he said those words to me, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. I got this strong feeling in my gut that said, he's wrong. He's wrong. Like I felt it. Didn't know how I was going to prove it, but I felt it. Right now, Lisa, 89% of girls and women will opt out of meaningful activities with friends, with family, in public because they don't like how they look. 89%? 89%. So there is a whole chapter in here about do not wait on your weight to live your best life. I do not care what your weight is, but do not wait on your weight to live your best life. I think back to so many times in my life before I learned how to build self-worth when I waited on my weight to go on the date, to get in the photo, to attend the reunion. So many of us do this. And it's like, ah, uh ah, -uh, the time for change has come. It is why I wrote Worthy. No girl, no woman, no person left behind. Ah, uh ah, -uh. 89% of us opt out of meaningful activities because we don't like how we look. What has this cost us in our life, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our joy, in our fulfillment? So in the moment this investor tells me this and I go cry, in the next six years, there are moments that come to me where I'm like, okay, well, maybe I do just need to change my weight. All those things, right? But I know that's a lie. I know it in my soul. I know it in my soul. And so when we talk briefly about like the four R's and reframing rejection, you know, in this case, every time his words would come to, to my mind where he's like, I don't believe women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight, that rejection was really painful for me. And I would reframe it with and redefine it with a new definition of, okay, Rejection's God's protection. Rejection's God's protection, right? For some of us, it'll be rejections, the universe's protection. And I don't know how yet, but I chose to believe it. I chose to redefine that rejection and every other one to something I believe was true so that I was not fearful of future rejections. And so even after that painful rejection, every time those words would echo back in my mind, I would instantly like literally intercept them, replace them with, oh, no, no, no. Rejection is God's protection. I cannot wait to see what's going to happen because God has got me. And yeah, that dude didn't believe in me, but you know what? I know it's protection. I don't know how yet. And I just kept going and kept going. And six years later, the day L'Oreal bought our company for $1.2 billion cash, uh, the day we had over a thousand employees, the day we had finally become number one in a bunch of the retailer stores we were in that had said no for years. The day you became the very first female CEO, baby, of L'Oreal. Yeah, first, yeah. Without, I mean, and they're a public company. And so they did, um, they announced the purchase price, right? And then that I was the first uh, female CEO of a brand in their 100 plus year history. But they, I, I did not know they were going to announce the purchase price. I, I think I had friends and family that thought maybe business is doing well, but <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> like nobody, you know what I mean? Those aren't things you just. And the day they announced the deal, it was everywhere. Homepage of the Wall Street Journal, and that was the first day I heard from that guy in over six years. Uh, and he said, the potential investor, right? And he says, congratulations on the L'Oreal deal. I was wrong. And in that moment. You know the movie Pretty Woman? Yes. You know the movie Pretty Woman where she goes in the store Best and they won't scene help her? Ever. They yeah. won't help her. And then she goes back in a few days later. So what I wanted to say to him was big, big mistake. mistake. 
huge, yeah. huge. And I wanted to go even further and go, I can give you 1.2 billion reasons why. It was a <laughs> huge mistake. Um, but I didn't say that. I kept it really, really classy um, <laughs> because I didn't want to be him at that day. Uh, mm. But here's what's wild. And this is why I go into reframing rejection so deeply and worthy because so many of us have had rejection or failure in our life. And it's so painful that it keeps us stuck. And at worst, we think we're, we're a failure and it becomes an identity level thing. So I go deep into how do you actually reframe it? And uh, and what I want to say is that, you know, I had been telling myself for years, rejection is God's protection around why this guy rejected me that time. And at that moment, six years later, when we sold to L'Oreal, what I realized is, oh my goodness, like had he believed in me back then, I was so desperate. I probably would have given him the majority of the company for like no money. I just want to stay alive. Like I didn't know how we were going to make it. But because he didn't believe in me, the day we sold to L'Oreal, we were the largest shareholders. And it was like, thank God he didn't believe. Rejection's God's protection. <laughs> like these things we know in our soul are true. And it's about how do we build that muscle, to use your words, how do we build that muscle and that skill set that when these things are happening to us, the setbacks, the rejections, the, the things that don't go our way, that we pull those tools out of the toolbox and we apply them right then and there. Okay, mm -hmm. in this case, rejection's God's protection. And we believe it. Like, how do we apply those tools, trusting that they're right and they're true? Because that's how we build resiliency. That's how we raise our self-worth. That's how we keep going for things. That's how we don't let setbacks hold us back. Like, we believe, okay, this is a setback, but I know most setbacks are setups for what I'm called to do next. Like, I'm going to have a faith in that universe. And it's not just about, oh, let me think positive. It's like, oh, uh-uh, let me believe that in my soul. Mm. Let me believe this new reframe in my soul because it is true. Like, when you check in with your soul, again, I said, I said, said this earlier, every person listening to us right now, yes, your confidence can be tied to your skills and abilities, your willingness to try and go for it, how you feel you stack up against other people. You know, the, there's studies that show the boxer who wins the match is automatically 30% more confident afterwards, mm. right? Our confidence rises and falls. But underneath that strong self-worth, separate from confidence, which is very important, your self-worth this is just what I want everyone to know right now is right now, as you are, I do not care if you are like me and you waitressed in a strip club and you waitressed at Denny's and you were doubting yourself out of your own destiny and you thought love uh, was confused with attention and you thought uh, uh, significance was an external praise, was being confused with success and all those things, right? You thought achievement was being confused with belonging. I don't care where you're at, what past mistakes, what failures. I do not care. I don't care who you've hurt and you regret. I mean, we how many mistakes you've made. Like right now, exactly as you are, you are fully worthy. Nobody can give it to you or take it away. Like you just are. And, and I believe, Lisa, that the greatest journey we're on in this lifetime is learning how to believe and embrace that. Because when we do, we are unstoppable. That's when we are unstoppable. That is when we are in alignment with our assignment. That is when we walk into our calling. That is when we stop doubting ourselves out of our own destiny. When we believe we are worthy, it changes everything for the better in our lives. For so many of us, we feel stuck or we feel like, oh, you know, I don't have what it takes to accomplish my dreams or to find love again or to have healthy friendships as an adult. And we tell ourselves all these lies that lead to self-doubt because literally, Lisa, like we don't soar to the level of our goals and dreams. We stay stuck at the level of our self-worth. So when you change your self-worth, you change every aspect of your life. And the beautiful thing is, it does not matter where you come from. It does not matter if you have waitress at a strip club like me. <laughs> it does not matter if you have you know, worked hard waitressing tables at Denny's like I have, or if you've built a billion dollar business like I have. None of that actually matters. Like You're fully worthy exactly as you are. And when we learn to unlearn those lies that lead to self-doubt and literally wake up our worthiness, it's the one thing that will change everything in our life. Dude, that's so freaking strong. All right, and now we're gonna go into the actual lies that we believe, and I wanna break them down because you write them in your book and they're so beautiful because I think 
99.9999% of people listening right now are going to feel exactly the same of, oh my God, I feel like that. That is me. And if you don't change that belief system, if you don't change how you think about it, then I don't think um, many of us can change our paths. We can't change our situation. And so um, I really want to go through the lies that we tell ourselves. Yes. Um, so number one, I'd love to start with the need to please them in order for them to love me. Mm. People pleasing is almost always a betrayal to ourselves. We are raised and so often as girls and women, but when you actually look at the data, over 50% of women believe they're a people pleaser, but over 40% of men do as well. Mm. So we are raised to think, oh, I just need to make everyone else happy and then I'll be loved, right? At our core, we all want love and belonging. And one of the big lies is I need to please everyone else in order to be loved or in order to be worthy, in order to be enough. And here's the problem with that is so often we spend our lives you know, trying to please everyone else, uh, but then actually betraying ourselves and we become disconnected from who we are, mm -hmm. right? And so the more we people please for others, when it's incongruent with who we are and what we really feel, the more we tell ourselves that we're actually not worthy uh, of saying what we mean, of being who we are. And it chips away at our self-worth slowly but surely. So it is a huge lie that we tell ourselves that, okay, if I just make everyone else happy, then I'll be happy, mm -hmm. then I'll be loved. And it's actually the opposite. And what's beautiful is when we, and I go into Worthy Deep and how to do this, how do you truly learn to, you know, not people please in the, at the expense of betraying yourself. Uh, and when you learn to do that, your relationships get stronger, your self-worth rises, right? You're able to have a deeper connection with other people because when you show up inauthentically, which is a lot of times what people pleasing is, you actually create a barrier of disconnection between yourself and that other person. Mm -hmm. So we think people pleasing, uh, you know, especially a lot of us as little girls and women were raised to like get approval when we make other people happy. But long-term, it doesn't feel like love. Long-term, it does not. And so a lot of us get disconnected even from who we are because we're so good at trying to make everyone else happy, but then not, not knowing even who we are and what we want. We all know the difference a good bar can make to your confidence, right? A sports bar may feel good, but the flat uni boob it gives you probably doesn't make you feel very sexy. And a push-up bra may make you feel sexy, but between the ungodly amounts of padding and the uncomfortable underwires, you're probably taking the torture device off before you even get home. But you don't have to choose between comfort and confidence anymore thanks to Honey Love. Honey Love has revolutionized the bra game designed with back smoothing fabric to prevent bra bulge, a bonded underbust to lift without the underwire, and no bulky fabric that trap heat. And right now, guys, you can get 20% off your entire order when you shop at honeylove.com slash W-O-I. Click the link below or go to honeylove.com slash W-O-I and you'll get 20% off your entire order. Treat yourself to Honey Love because, my homie, you deserve it. Dude, this is so strong and I'd love to dig even deeper and say, how do we do that? Because you even said, in that moment sometimes when you've pleased someone, let's say you're in a relationship and you've really done something that it doesn't feel in alignment, but the other person is like giving you the accolades. They're telling you how amazing you are for doing this thing that actually doesn't feel good to you. And so it becomes almost like a bit of a downward spiral or you just double up, right? Cause you're like, oh, well they made me feel good about myself when I did this. I really like the feeling of feeling good for my with myself. So I'm just gonna do it again. But long-term, like you said, it actually doesn't align. So how do you start yeah. to break that? What are the things that in fact, let's just take a random Wednesday, Jamie. Yes. So random Wednesday, you're a people pleaser. You get your validation from other people, from them applauding you. You wake up on a Wednesday and you've got all these habits, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like you're used to, let's say you're a mom, taking care of the kids first, taking maybe care of your partner, maybe going to work, earning the money, coming home. Like you get into like these habitual patterns. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually even start to break that? Mm. The very first thing is to start asking yourself, how does this feel to my soul? Because when we do something really great for someone else, it could be a great thing. You know, if I know my husband likes, you know, something, you know, a banana with peanut butter on it or whatever, 
uh, great. Like when we do things that are that are kind for other people, but it feels aligned with our soul, that's great. It's great to text our friends, you know, and uplift them. It's great to do all that. But when you get still and ask yourself, am I doing something that actually is incongruent with how I really feel? That's people pleasing at the expense of betraying yourself. And so often people say, oh, do you want to come over for coffee or do you want to do this or do you want to do that or can you volunteer for this or can you donate to this? And and we want to say no, but we say yes. Mm-hmm. And when what we do comes at the expense of our own truth, that's when it can chip away at our self-worth. And a lot of us have learned to do that our whole lives, right? And so that is where it causes problems in your self-worth. That is when it creates barriers of disconnection in relationships. And we all know, and for most of us, we've done this, we've gotten in a relationship and you know, the stereotypical like story you'll see in a movie where like the girl just all of a sudden loves this kind of music because her boyfriend's into it, Mm -hmm. or she starts dressing a certain way because that's what he wants, right? And in the beginning of a relationship, it makes, it might appear to make him happy, but long-term it either never works out or it works out at the expense of her own soul, Mm. right? So these things that might make someone else happy in the short term, long term, we're living a lie. We're creating a barrier of disconnection. And so it's so important because we start to believe I need to please them in order to love me. And it is a lie. It is a big lie, right? When we please someone else, and then end up not loving ourselves because of it, it literally will lower our self-worth slowly but surely. The very first step is identifying how does this feel and just paying attention. Because for most of us, we become so numb to just saying the thing that makes the other person happy, saying the thing that's not true, but we're not aware of what does that cost us. How many of us women ignore that intuition, that gut feeling? Um, And so I think that that's so strong in just starting there because I think sometimes you've um, you've been, you know, you have a belief system that no, you are supposed to do or you should do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And that's supposed to and should, I think, is part of what you're saying, where it's like we we show up in service of everybody else except for ourselves. Yeah. And I have a quote of yours that really freaking hit me. Um, I want to be loved more than I want to be me. Mm-hmm. Yes. In Worthy the Book, I share a story about how my mother-in-law is very into eating healthy and is all the things and I am not so much. And we were, at, we were at a holiday gathering and there was broccoli and berries and then there was these cinnamon rolls. And I kept looking at the cinnamon rolls and I just felt like if I eat it, she's going to judge me. And I just, I have to go with the broccoli. And I write this whole story about how in that moment, I chose to be what I thought was loved more than I chose to be me. And I talk about how every time we do this, uh, we think that we're gonna be loved. We think we're creating approval or connection with the other person when all we're doing is betraying ourselves and creating a barrier of disconnection. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing about relationships is you can only, I don't care how good you are at being a people pleaser, the depth of love and connection you can have with another person can only be as deep as the depth of love and connection you have with yourself. And when you show up people pleasing for everyone else, thinking it's gonna result in them loving you, before anything even happens, you start to love yourself less, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're betraying yourself. And then you're also creating a barrier of disconnection between you and them. And so for a lot of people, and especially women, right? The 50 plus percent of women that say they're people pleasers and they struggle with it all the time. It's scary to think like, well, what if I speak my truth? And what if I offend somebody? Or what if that person doesn't like me? Or what if, right? All of those things. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, like every one of us, every one of us craves love and belonging in our lives for fulfillment. We crave it in our relationships and our friendships, all of it, right? For 25 years of the Oprah Winfrey show, that at the end of every single show, whether it was president of the United States, which she interviewed many of them, or Beyonce, or a murderer, it didn't matter who was on her show. At the very end, they were like, how was it? Was it okay? 
was it okay? And she says that she realized every single person wants to know, like, did you see me? Did, did you hear me? Did what I say matter to you? And at our core as human beings, every single one of us wants that same thing. We want to know, like, did you see me? Did you, did you hear me? Did what I say matter to you? And here's the problem is when we show up people pleasing and betraying ourselves, we are not showing who we truly are. We're not being seen for who we truly are. We're not saying what we really mean. And so it's impossible to create that ultimate expression of love and connection and humanity if we're showing up as something that's not who we are. When you learn to start one step at a time, right? We could do baby steps here. So for everyone watching and listening, like take this one baby step today, a first just here when you tell somebody something, how did that feel? Did that feel like the truth? Did that feel in my gut, in my soul, like what I really mean? And we are so conditioned just to, you know, please everyone else. But when we start paying attention, we're like, oh, wait a minute. That's not what I mean. I don't want the broccoli. I want the cinnamon roll. You know what I mean? It's like we're right. And, and no, no, I don't want to go to that movie. I want to go to this movie. Like, like, just little things of paying attention to, wait, am I showing up as who I truly am? And then taking that baby step, right? So even today, everyone watching us and listening to us, taking that one step of just doing it once today, just, just one time, say your truth, even if you know that other person's going to be like, hmm, right? Because they're used to hearing what they want to hear. Just do that one thing. And you just take that baby step, one, one step at a time. And what happens is, yeah, there are going to be some people along the way Maybe they're not your friends anymore. Maybe they're uncomfortable. Maybe it takes them a while to adjust. But over time, it is how you build a relationship with yourself. It is how you raise your own self-worth. And remember, in life, like we don't rise to what we believe is possible. We fall to what we believe we're worthy of. And every time we people please someone else as a betrayal to ourselves, we tell ourselves, I am not worthy of saying what I really mean. I'm not worthy of showing up as who I really am, right? And, and, and that impacts every aspect of your life. So take that one step today, mm -hmm. right? Say what you mean, one step at a time. And over time, you start building your self-worth and you start building that depth of connection with, and, and real friendships and, and real partnerships. Right now, as, as we're talking, how many people are in a relationship and they just feel like something's missing and they don't know why they don't feel the depth of connection that they crave, and it could be a romantic relationship, it could be a friendship, it could be a relationship with your family. But like, I don't understand why we're not so connected. I want that connection. But then when you stop and ask yourself, wait a minute, do I have that connection with myself? Right? And that's where we need to do the work. And slowly but surely, the more that you show up as who you truly are, then you'll see the connection that the people in your life starts to deepen and you start to feel fulfillment and you feel more fulfilled and less like something's missing. Mm, good. I love that. And that's why I love that story about the broccoli and the cinnamon roll <laughs> because it's those little, it's a little decision. It's yeah. a little thing that maybe other people would just brush by yeah. and not think twice about. And it's like, well, it's my mother-in-law. I know that she's going to look down on me. If I choose the cinema, I'm fine. I'll choose the bra. Right? And you don't realize to your point of the disconnection you're having your with yourself, but then yes. also to her because yes. you're being a false version of who you actually yes. are. Exactly. And so much of the time we think we need to people please someone else and this and that. And it's still a lie we're telling ourselves. I was sitting there thinking my mother-in-law is going to judge me for eating the cinnamon roll. I'm going to eat the bra broccoli. Meanwhile, uh, how the story kind of wraps up is I'm like, you know what? I decide if I'm going to have an authentic connection with her, I need to show up as who I really am. I eat the cinnamon roll. I'm waiting for her to judge me. And she literally starts talking about the kids and how she could care less mm. that I ate the cinnamon roll. Mm. So the whole time I was telling myself a story, projecting my own insecurities onto her and creating a barrier of disconnection between me and her in the meantime, mm -hmm. right? All because I was telling myself a lie that she was judging me so that I was trying to please her because I wanted connection, realizing when you try to please other people, you just create disconnection. Yeah, oh God, that's so freaking strong. And that goes to another lie that you talk about in the book is that we always think we're gonna be enough when. Mm. So talk to me about that. Yeah, 
I'm going to like get so fired up yeah, out of this chair. Go. <laughs> okay, everybody watching and listening right now, Lisa, this is the lie. This is the lie that will take us down our entire life. This was, this is the lie that has us thinking, okay, I just got to do more. I just got to achieve more. Then I'll feel enough, right? This is the lie that thinks that, that tells us because something's missing, it means I'm not yet enough. And oh my gosh, the lie that once I finally get the thing or achieve the thing or do the thing, then I'm enough. It is a perpetual lie that leads literally to nowhere. And so let me just start by asking like this question, right? For everyone who's listening and watching us right now, um, uh, have you ever had this goal in your life and you thought when I finally get that goal, then I'm going to be happy. Then I'm going to be fulfilled. Then I'm going to be enough. And for some people, it might be like, when I finally hit the salary level of my job, or for some people, it might be like, oh, when I finally, you know, get married, or when I finally have the white picket fence, or when I finally have 2.5 kids, or when I finally, you know, uh, uh, get that degree, or when I finally get that dream car, or the six pack abs, or that certain fit, whatever it is, when I finally get that thing, like then, then I'm going to be happy, then I'm going to be enough, then I'm going to be worthy. And then what happens for so many of us, right? And everyone think about that thing right now or different examples in your life. But for so many of us, we work so, so, so hard. And for some of us, we spend a lot of time and a lot of years. And then what happens? We finally get that thing. We finally get that job title or that number in our bank account or that number on the scale or the six pack abs, the relationship. And we finally get it. And then what happens? Like, does it, right? And think about this in your own life? Did it solve all your problems? Did it make you happy? Did you finally feel like, yes, I feel fulfilled and I can ride off into the sunset in full fulfillment and bliss? For most of us, the answer is no, right? We arrive at the thing and then we go, okay, and we're happy. And for some of us, we're super happy for maybe a year or a month or a week or a few hours. And then we're right back there to feeling like, huh, okay, that didn't fulfill everything. I still don't feel like I'm enough. So then what do we do? Right? I still don't feel fulfilled. We think, huh, I've just got to achieve more. I just got to take it to the next level. Then that will be enough. And this becomes a perpetual cycle. So here's the deal. Here's the lie. Here's how we change it. <laughs> because this is big. <laughs> Self-worth is the one thing that changes everything. And when you look at overall fulfillment in life, you always need uh, to be growing, right? And that could be growing in your faith, growing in a hobby, growing in how you show up in the world, growing in your fitness goals, whatever it is. But we always need to be growing. This is for ultimate fulfillment. We always need to be contributing to something beyond ourselves, which could be in the form of some type of service or in the form of being a friend to someone who doesn't have one. It could be in the form of donating. It could be whatever, but always about something bigger than ourselves. So contribution, growth. We always need to be building self-confidence, which is so important. But those three things combined are multiplied by our level of self-worth for ultimate fulfillment. And when I say that in life, we don't become what we want, we become what we believe we're worthy of, self-worth is the foundation to everything. It's truly the foundation. And so many of us are really good at doing all the things that build self-confidence, like getting the job title, getting the marriage, getting the kids, getting the fitness goals, getting the six-pack abs. Self-confidence can fluctuate based on our skills and abilities, if we're winning or losing, uh, if we're our willingness to try and go for it. Self-confidence, even though it's internal, it's based so much on the external things happening around us. Self-worth is deep internal, unwavering. It's us believing we are worthy of love and belonging exactly as we are. Not as we achieve, not as our past mistakes and failures, exactly as we are. And self-worth in so many ways is the foundation and self-confidence is like the house we build upon it, right? Here's the thing. From the moment we are born into our world, and especially those of us in the U.S. or any country that's like super driven, right, by, by uh, socioeconomic success and all the other things, we are taught that if we achieve the thing, get the thing, then, it, then we'll be happy. So, so we're raising advertisements all around us that tell us when we get the six-pack abs or when we get that dream car or when we hit that number in our bank account and we continue to think 
all those things will bring us fulfillment. When really, they all bring us a lot of confidence, which is important, right? And when we're doing them and impacting others, they bring us, you know, contribution and we're growing. Those are all important. But if underneath it all, we don't believe we're enough as we are, if underneath it all, we don't have strong self-worth, what that looks like is perpetual unfulfillment the rest of our lives. And there are so many perfectionists right now, probably listening and watching us, so many people that think like, okay, if I just achieve enough, then I'll be enough. If I just get the, and then they arrive in it and it's not. So then they go for the next thing and then it's still not. And they live their entire lives and arrive at the end of their life with a whole lot of cool things, but never actually feeling fulfillment and always feeling like something's missing. So it is important to do all of these things that build self-confidence, that do all that. It's important. But if you don't learn how to completely build rock solid and shakeable self-worth underneath it all, you will never, no matter how much you achieve, you'll never arrive feeling fulfilled. You'll never be able to fully enjoy it. Here's the other part of this. Uh, I have to do all this to be enough, which is a lie I believed most of my entire life. And a big reason, Lisa, that I wrote Worthy is because believing this lie, if I do enough, then I'll be enough. Like believing that and for me not understanding the difference between self-confidence and self-worth had me arriving at all these crazy dreams I could have only imagined happening and not understanding why don't I feel like it's enough and why don't I feel like I'm enough, right? And just to share a couple examples, I remember building at Cosmetics and years and years and years of rejections, finally building it to companies with over a thousand employees, right? Selling it to L'Oreal for over a billion dollars cash. I got to that moment where I thought, this is it. I, I had sold my company for all this money and was on in Forbes and all the magazines, all these things. And, and, and I had so much self-confidence and I got invited to Oprah's house for lunch. And I was like, this is my lifelong dream. And I went to her house. We had a three-hour lunch, just me and her. At the end of the lunch, Lisa, she gave me her cell phone number. And she said, call me anytime. You can call me anytime. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, you know, freaking <laughs> yeah. out, right? And now I had a lot of self-confidence. Everything on the outside was going so well. But what I didn't know is that is very different than self-worth. And even though a lot was going well, underneath it all, I didn't fully feel worthy. And so here's what happened. She gives me her cell phone number. My lifelong dream is like happening. I did not call her for four years. I literally didn't call her for four years. And this is what happens when we don't believe we're worthy underneath mm -hmm. everything else. We will sabotage opportunities. We will stay stuck. We will not go for things and not understand why. And after four years, during that whole stretch where I didn't call her, I would tell myself stories like, okay, once I have the perfect thing to say, mm. once I have the perfect thing to say, then I'll call her. That's why I'm not calling her. I just don't have the perfect thing to say. Or she probably thinks everyone wants something from her. So I'm going to prove I don't and I'm not going to call. Like all these stories I would tell myself. And four years later, I realized that the reason I hadn't called her was because deep down inside, I did not feel worthy of being her friend. And the moment I realized that, number one, like I realized very quickly that's a lie. Like I am a kick-ass friend. <laughs> you know yes, what I mean? you all go. <laughs> like, like, and in that moment, I'm like, oh mm -hmm. my gosh, my self-doubt and my thoughts, which we are not our thoughts, but our thoughts can convince us we are them sometimes. And my self-doubt and my thoughts had gotten so loud and were telling me I wasn't worthy of it. But that moment when I realized it, I felt in my soul, which is very different in my soul, my knowing like, oh, I am more than worthy of being her friend or anybody's friend. I'm a great friend, right? And that was the moment I picked up the phone and called her. I came so close to doubting myself out of my own destiny even though I had built all these things that the world would say look like enough, so I must feel like I'm enough, right? And I still didn't, and I didn't know why. So it's a perpetual lie that we just need to keep getting enough, achieving enough, hitting enough goals to finally feel enough. All of those things are important. They all build self-confidence, which is really, really important. But nothing you can achieve 
will build self-worth. I have got, I've got so many questions here. <laughs> okay, where do I even start? So first of all, how did you start to identify those were excuses that you were giving yourself and that it actually came from the self-worth? Because I'm sure so many people listening right now it may trigger some people going, oh my God, yes, I do it. But there's other people that even right now, the excuse that they're telling themselves, they actually believe. And I have utter compassion, right? It comes from a, a um, I mean this in a sweet way, I guess, but like it comes from a broken place where you mm -hmm. feel broken enough where you don't feel whole, you don't feel complete, you don't feel worthy mm -hmm. to be able to then be a great friend. So how did you start to recognize that those were excuses? And then how did you pivot going from I'm not enough to call her to immediately like for four years mm -hmm. and then you pick up the phone and call how what's mm -hmm. that gap yeah so the gap is this we all I just didn't know right and I didn't realize oh I'm telling myself excuses exactly. I actually believe them right that's, I actually that's truly, a worst freaking excuse yeah yeah I believe them they're lies mm -hmm. I believed you know just like my whole life mm -hmm. oh when I achieve enough then I'll feel enough you know, all of those things. And so it was a moment that hit me like a ton of bricks where I feel like, um, you know, Oprah calls them aha moments. Mm -hmm. I would describe it as a moment my knowing surpassed my conditioned belief system. Ooh, I would define an that. aha moment as the, mo and we've all had them, right? The moment your knowing surpasses your conditioned belief system. And sometimes they come out of the blue and they hit us like a ton of bricks right? And, and sometimes we work really, really hard to tune in and to hear our own gut and say, what is the truth, mm -hmm. right? They can come in different forms. This was a moment that hit me like a ton of bricks. And in that moment, it took everything out of me to literally, I imagined myself in that moment, Lisa, turning down the volume as if it was a volume dial, turning down the volume on my own self-doubt and my thoughts, right? And turning up the volume on my knowing or my intuition that said, you are worthy of being her friend because <laughs> I know that's the truth. And right now, every single person listening to us, watching us right now, if you get still and you tune into that knowing, not in your thoughts in your head that our whole lives we've been conditioned to learn we're not enough, right? 80% of women do not believe they're enough right now. And it is a lie, right? But the do, but I'm not enough, that comes in the form of our belief systems and our thoughts, but that is not who you are. Every single person right now, if you get still for a moment and you tune into your gut, to your knowing, to your intuition, it'll tell you right now, oh, you are more than enough. Mm -hmm. You are fully worthy exactly as you are, like exactly as you are. And when we learn to trust that and to trust that knowing, it changes everything. So that moment when I decided to call her, it was like I literally imagined just turning down the volume on my self-doubt. I was like, I am not listening to this anymore. And just tuning into that knowing, right? And just like putting that on full blast that says, I know, I know I'm a great friend. Like I know I'm worthy of calling Oprah. And, and that's when I just picked up the phone and did it and just took that step and did not let my self-doubt doubt me out of my own destiny. And it's one step at a time. Every person right now today we're going to do this. Like literally, we're going to do this. Like no girl, no woman, no person left behind in knowing they're worthy. Because when you believe you are worthy, the second you decide to believe you are worthy is the moment every single area of your life changes. It's the moment past and future generations of your family change. Like the second we believe we're enough is the second it changes everything. It impacts everything. Because again, we do not rise to what we believe is possible. We fall to what we believe we're worthy of. Everything that you've just said, it may resonate for a moment, right? Yeah. Everyone listening, like inspiration, motivation, we know yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. But when that person leaves, after they finish watching this interview yes. and they're sitting by themselves and they yes. get that ding, they get someone telling them they're not good enough. Yes. How the hell do they make sure they don't stay there? That's why I yes. like to go deep so that they've then got these tactics to then go back to. I love this so much. There is a masterclass in this book and a whole framework on the mm -hmm. four R's where you go deep into how do you identify your current definition of rejection? How do you redefine it? How do you revisit past rejections and redefine them? How do you become fearless over rejection and failure in your life, right? Because part of my journey was hundreds and hundreds of no and rejection over years building it cosmetics a lot of times when people google the story they're like oh it's a fairy tale yeah, yeah. I'm like oh <laughs> not so much right but a lot of us we fear rejection and failure as something that is painful so then we avoid doing stuff at all costs we stay stuck 
I so easily could have been in that Oprah situation, could have still not called her for four years and could be sitting here with you right now thinking, oh yeah, I just got to, uh, I'm just still not enough. I got to achieve more. I got to do more. I got to accomplish more. Then I'll call her, right? I would still be thinking I need to do all the things that build confidence or whatever, but not understanding, oh wait, it's a self-worth issue. Mm -hmm and not understanding the difference. I want to say one thing before I forget too, is you're using this example of the train, right? And mm-hmm. you get off or you get on mm-hmm. and here's the thing too, is like, oh my gosh, for everyone listening, I keep like hitting your couch. I'm getting so it excited. Is, right? getting so excited <laughs> here. Um, but for everyone listening and watching us right now, how many times have the train doors open and we didn't get oh. on because we didn't feel we were worthy of it? We didn't feel where we hesitated. We held back. And who freaking knows what would have happened if we stepped on because we believe we're worthy of it and the door is closed and we go to a whole new destination, right? That is why, like, that is why I'm so passionate about this, about building self worth, because so many of us have doubted ourselves out of so many things in our destiny. You know, I mean, I came so close to, to, to never calling Oprah, right? And, and, and in my case, that was a lifelong dream I was sabotaging. Mm-hmm. I would have never then taught a course with her. All the things. I would have been on a different train. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been on a train teaching course with Oprah, which for me means so much. So how many things for you and everybody listening mean so much, but you didn't get on the train yet? And the doors are open. And then they close and the train takes off. But the good news is, just like a train schedule, there's another one coming. So how do you believe you're worthy of stepping on that train when it pulls right up to you and when the doors open? Because the trains are going to keep coming. Mm -hmm. But for so many of us, it's like we still don't step on that. We still don't put our art out into the world. We still don't show up on social media as who we authentically are. We still don't tell the person we want to be more than just friends right? We still don't register the domain for our business. We still don't set that boundary with the family member, right? We still don't, you know, turn the lights on in the bedroom. We still don't put the swimsuit on in summer, right? All those things. And we're missing the train. We're missing the train. And that is what self-worth will do. Time for change has come, Lisa Bilyeu, right here, right now on Women of Impact. Time for change has come. Literally, when you build your self-worth, it changes everything. Okay, four R's of rejections. So there's a whole chapter called, when you change your relationship with rejection, you change your life. And, you know, as human beings, let me just set this up right now, because a lot of us don't know why fully we're stuck or why we're not going for the things or why we are staying in a relationship when we feel in our soul we deserve better, but maybe we're afraid to be alone or afraid to put ourselves out there. There's so many ways that fear of rejection and failure hold us back and talk ourselves out of our own truth and all the things. Uh, So just to take a step back, as human beings, we're wired to avoid pain at all costs right? It's how we've survived. And it's why for some of us, uh, when we when we associate pain with working out, even though we know the pleasure of, you know, feeling great and, you know, hitting our fitness goals and all that, we will choose to avoid the pain mm-hmm. over going for the pleasure most every time. And with rejection and failure, when we fear them, we often fear them for very painful reasons. We associate pain with them. So much so that it keeps us stuck. Mm. So many of us not only fear rejection and failure, we've had so many of them happen in our lives that we literally let it take root at an identity level and we start to believe we're a failure. Mm -hmm. We start to label ourselves with things like rejected, right? Failure, not enough, don't fit in, unqualified, all the things. So Let me just start. We're going to go through the four R's together, okay? Everyone listening, watching, let's do this together. You got to go all in with me and Lisa, though. Got to go all in uh, and and, and be really honest with yourself because this will be eye-opening, I think, for a lot of people when they Mm -hmm. go through this. So let me just start with a question, okay? Because the four R's are uh, uh, to uh, reveal, to redefine, to revisit, and to revel. But let me explain what that means and how it can literally change your life right now. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not 
fill in the blank. One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. The first thing is right now when you ask yourself this question, think about a time in your life where you've been rejected or failed at something. What is the first thought you had? And be really honest with yourself. And you might need to kind of imagine yourself in a, in a situation where, where you've been rejected or you failed. What is the first thought without thinking about it? This happens without us thinking about it. But what's the first thought you thought to yourself when that happens? Um, okay, first thought. See, I told you you're stupid. Mm-hmm. That would be your first thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. For me, my first thought most of my life is, yep, I'm not enough. Yep, there's proof again. Mm -hmm. I'm not enough. And yours is, yep, I told you you're stupid. Mm -hmm. Lisa, Bill, you. Okay. Whenever I've been in rooms and I've asked this question, the number of answers that people are so vulnerable and, and brave to share are so similar to yours and mine. Mm -hmm. Like, I should have never tried. I knew it. I don't have what it takes. I'm a loser. I'm, you know, stupid. It's like the confirmation of the negative that you think of yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And so here's what happens. And for so many of us, you know, watching us right now, everyone who just thought of that thought, write it down, write it down if you can. I don't want you to forget this, but that very first thought you had, some of us have multiple, we can mm -hmm. have multiple, write them down, right? For me, it was almost always, yep, there's proof again, I'm not enough every time. What your thought you just had right now is, is your current definition of rejection or failure. Mm -hmm. That is your current definite. So we've just revealed, first R, your current definition of rejection or failure. For most of us, that definition is so painful that we want to avoid it at all costs. So because here's the thing in life, everything is the meaning we assign to something, mm -hmm. right? And if you are assigning a meaning to rejection or failure that's painful, we're wired to avoid that at all costs, which is then why we feel stuck, why we're not going for things, why we're not taking things to the next level. We don't want to risk feeling like, oh yeah, I'm stupid, I'm not enough, I'm a loser, all, all the pain that comes with rejection or, or, or failing, mm -hmm. right? So revealing your current definition is huge. And for every person who just had a thought of their current definition that's painful, it is most likely a big reason of why you're stuck or a big reason of why you haven't necessarily taken stuff to the next level or why you're not sure why you're not back on the dating app or you're not going up to the person at the party or any of those things. If our definition stays painful for our entire lives, it will prevent us from taking our life to the next level, right? And we will end up looking back and going, wow, what has fear of rejection or failure already cost us in our life? And for so many of us, the answer is way too much. Even to pause this episode or to, to do this at the end of the episode and really take some time mm -hmm. and think, what has this current definition mm -hmm. of rejection and failure already cost me in my life? And you can even do it by categories in my life, in my relationships, mm -hmm. in my friendships, in my hopes and dreams, mm -hmm. in my career ambitions, in my joy, in moments of being at the pool with everybody, moments with mm -hmm. my children, all of it, right? Moments of celebration. What does it cost me when I look in the mirror? For a lot of us, we reject ourselves mm -hmm. like, and we're afraid of it. So the first thought everyone just wrote out that you just had for Lisa, yours was... I'd see, I told you that you're stupid. Yeah, see, I told you that you're stupid. And for me, my whole life, it's been, oh yeah, there's proof I'm not enough. And so that's our current definition. We, we have revealed our current definition, the first R. So the second R is to redefine the meaning we attach to rejection and failure when it happens in our life. How this happened for me, it was years and years of rejections. And one day I'd had a really painful rejection from QVC. I knew in my soul, this is the thing. When you have, so many of us think our intuition's wrong. 
It's not wrong. It's just divine timing isn't right yet. Okay. I knew in my gut, in my soul, we were supposed to be on QVC, which is the live television shopping channel broadcast to 100 million homes. But every time I sent them our product, it was a no, right? Every time. And, and eventually, we built the biggest beauty brand in QVC's history. <laughs> so I was in the season of long rejections. I just got a real painful rejection from QVC. I was under my covers, crying myself to sleep, all that. And I remember I just felt like, why do I keep feeling like I'm supposed to keep going? Every time I pray about it and get still, I feel like I'm supposed to keep going when everyone around me is rejecting me or telling me no or saying it's never going to work. And uh, one day, Lisa, I Googled all the people I admire most, people that have just crushed it in business, have built huge successes, thought leaders, people that have moved humanity forward, people that have been forces for good and love in this world. And I just started reading about all of them, every single one of them has dealt with tons of rejections and failures. They're just the brave ones willing to keep going anyways. Mm -hmm. And that day I wrote out this new definition for rejection. I wrote, rejection does not mean I'm not enough. Rejection means this is a victory because I'm one of the brave ones who's willing to keep going for it, right? I'm not one of the people sitting on the sidelines, you know, uh, uh, not going for it, living my life in regret. I'm going to decide right now that every time a rejection happens, every time I fail again at something, this is huge. This is a victory. This means this is a reminder I'm one of the brave ones willing to go for it. Mm -hmm. And I literally believe that, right? And I wrote out that definition. Another one that I wrote out was rejections, God's protection. Oprah loves rejections, redirection, right? We all have these meanings that we write out, but they have to be true in your soul. And so the second R, which is redefine, is so important. And, and you can use, you know, some of the ones I've shared, you can, you know, you can write your own new definition, but it has to feel true in your soul. It could be like, you know, rejection means I'm putting in the reps and I'm one step closer to getting what I want. You know, I'm putting in the reps, like whatever resonates with you. But step two, the second R is to write out a new definition of rejection that you are going to every time you face rejection or failure and you're tempted to play that old soundtrack, you intercept it, you replace it with your new definition you know to be true. And, and I so, assume that that new, uh, that new one also has to propel you forward. Yeah, yeah. And what it does, Lisa, it, make, it builds resiliency. Mm -hmm. You start to fear rejection and failure less because you're not attaching pain with it anymore, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, I started doing that every time. And, and in this season, in this long stretch, I don't know that I could have ever had the outcome I had with my business had I not learned how to do this. Mm -hmm. But this applies to our personal lives. It applies to every area of our dating lives, right? Every, our friendships that we're trying to build because most all of us deal with rejection every day in different ways, failure every day. It's just most people aren't posting it on social media. Mm -hmm. So we scroll and we think everything's great and we're the only ones, right? Not true. But when we learn how to literally embrace it and not fear it, it changes everything. And so your second one, and you can do this right now, is to write out a new definition. And I love writing more than one, mm. keeping them in my toolbox. Um, you know, another example, I, I was adopted and placed into adoption the day I was born. And growing up, I had the best parents ever. And they worked a lot. The parents who adopted me worked all the time. And when I found out by surprise I was adopted in my 20s, I went through this season of my life where I just felt like I was abandoned. I felt like I was abandoned. I felt like my parents were never there growing up, this whole thing. And I felt rejected, mm -hmm. you know? And I redefined my definition of what had happened to me. And in that case, I was like, oh, I wasn't rejected. I was chosen. Like I was chosen by my birth mom to come into this world. Her, her, her life would have been way easier had she not done that. I was chosen by God to be conceived. My birth parents were together one time ever and never again. And I was chosen by my adoptive parents to raise me. I'm not rejected. I'm chosen, right? So that's another example. And it changed my life when I decided that's my story. That's the meaning I'm attaching to things. When we do this, it is a powerful tool. Uh, and so, you know, take some time and write out what are some new true definitions I'm going to attach 
to rejection and failure every time it happens in my life. And when you do this, it literally helps you just become more fearless going after things, helps you embrace rejection and failure more, becomes so much more resilient. The third R is called revisit. And this is about the power of revisiting past def- past rejections and failures in your life and then redefining the meaning you give to them. Mm-hmm. For so many of us, we have been hurt. We've been rejected. We have had things not go our way. We feel like we've had so many failures and setbacks. And a lot of times we've given a meaning to them that can take root at our identity and really impact our self-worth, right? And, and, and we've been carrying that meaning for so long. Labels that like this are not permanent. They are like post-it notes with a light adhesive and we can remove them even though for a lot of us we've been carrying the weight of these like heavy armor for some of us for decades. So revisit the third R is the most powerful. And when you go back to potentially a rejection from someone who broke your heart or someone in your family who did not know how to love you the way you needed to be loved. It could be a number of things. And your identity would be tied to that as I'm someone that's not lovable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm someone that's not lovable. I'm someone that, you know, I'm in my case of being adopted or having my parents over there, I not just I'm rejected, but I'm a reject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, um, you know, we feel like our past mistakes don't just mean that we did something bad. We think it means we're bad. Mm -hmm. So these things can take real root when we really look at the story we're telling ourselves about it, and they can really affect our self-worth. Um, and so when we revisit past rejections and just first just become aware, what is the meaning I'm giving to this? What is the definition and the meaning I'm attaching to that? And rewriting that meaning, rewriting that meaning. And this is really powerful. And then every time that memory comes to you, just like anything else, you catch it and you replace it. But like for me, every time I'm tempted to be like, I'm, I'm abandoned, I'm rejected, I'm a reject, I don't belong, I'm unwanted, I instantly replace that, oh, uh-uh, I'm chosen. I am chosen. I am here on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. Like I replace it right away. And this is real powerful stuff because it takes root at our identity. It's not just about, oh, let me think positive, uh-uh. This is deep stuff of how we define who we are that affects every single one of us. And so so when we revisit and redefine our new definition, it can be so, so, so powerful. And uh, and one of my favorite ways to do this, my favorite definitions to use for the third R, and this is, I think, so good for anyone who's had someone pull the rug out from underneath them, break their heart, not value you. You know, it, it could be it could be deep stuff. It could also just be, you wanted that job so bad. You applied for it over and over and over and you, they, didn't, they didn't hire you. It could be a lot of things. This is my favorite definition when I redefine stuff in the past. I literally, Lisa, I imagine God saying to me, oh, you weren't rejected. I hid your value from them because they're not assigned to your destiny. And I choose to believe it. And And over time, we learn these things are true. Like how many times has like the dude broken your heart and everyone was like, he is no good for you, but you're like, I love him. Mm -hmm. And you want it to work so bad and he just doesn't see your value. Now, 10 years later, you're like, thank God I did not end (laughs) Mm -hmm. up with him. Thank God I did not end up with him, right? God hid my value from him because he is not assigned to my destiny. And Lisa, to this day, even, you know, if we have friends and for some reason I'm not invited or, or or there's someone I just adore them and I don't know why, but no matter what I do, they're just not into me. <laughs> they're just like, they just don't want to be friends. And the old me would say, oh, I'm not enough. Da, da, da. Now I'm like, oh, God's blocking my value from them because they're not assigned to my destiny. Mm. And it prevents me from letting this take root at a worth or identity level. I believe this definition. I believe this. 
And over time, sometimes we don't see it right away, but over time, these new definitions, they prove to be true because you knew in your soul they were true when you wrote them, mm-hmm. right? When you know in your, and that's why when you write out your new definitions, you got to know in your soul level, they are true. Whether for you, it's, you know, um, rejection is the universe's protection. The universe always has my back. I'm going to trust it. You know, uh, whether it's for me, oh, God hid my value from them because they're not assigned to my destiny. Over time, like I know that is true in my soul. And so over time, they, it always proves right. Rejection's God's protection in the case of the investor, mm. whatever they are. And what this does is it completely flips that fear of rejection and failure on its head. It instantly helps us get unstuck, right? It instantly just inspires us to go for things because we know what's the worst that can happen, that I'm reminded I'm one of the brave ones willing to go for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then the fourth R is to revel in the fact that you become real fearless about rejection and failure and that you no longer believe you're, like in my case, a reject or a failure. And this is such a powerful tool because it impacts our self-worth. And you open this interview with something I have never shared in my life about working as a waitress in a strip club. And I was also waitressing at Denny's at the same time. And I had another job I got shortly after slicing meat in the deli. And I was just hustling, trying to make it, trying to you know, pay my way through school, all the things. But at the time, I knew in my, my gut I had these big dreams and these big like, and I, I just felt, I just felt like um, I'm here on this earth to serve and to impact and to, to give and, and, and to create. But I was in this moment in my life where I didn't believe I was worthy of those things. And all of these tools, had I not learned them, I would have never stepped on the trains when the doors opened. And I'm just like, to be here, I'm going to get emotional if I talk about this, Mm -hmm. but honestly, like to be here with you talking about these things, to know that 80% of girls and women don't believe they're enough right now as we're talking, like 73% of men feel inadequate. Like this affects every area of our lives. And I feel like I know in my soul when we learn to believe we are enough and worthy exactly as we are is the moment every single thing in our entire life changes. It's the moment we step on the train and and, and it's the train to our destiny. But so many people, they want to step and they don't and they doubt themselves out of their own destiny. So literally the time for change has come, Lisa Bill. You, no girl, no woman, no person left behind and knowing they are worthy. That was so freaking amazing the way you broke that down. And as you were doing it, I was like, this is like the medicine and the recipe, right? If you want to be a chef, you need to know what ingredients do what to something. And then you can try, you can dabble, you can follow someone else's instructions, you can create your own. But we don't think that about life. I used to think when I was younger, extremely insecure that, you know, girl in North London that was getting bullied for her looks, I would look at Oprah and I would look at other people amazing and I would just dismiss them. Mm. I would dismiss them because I was like, well, they're born special. Mm. So I, I could never do that. And it, it was um, a great soothing mechanism in real time to make me feel better about myself, to just dismiss other people that were amazing. And then it, that way I didn't have to challenge or look at myself. Mm. And having gone through my own evolution and meeting you, it's insane how wrong that was. Mm. And I will let you speak for yourself, but I don't think I'm anything special. I just think I'm resilient enough to keep on going when I get dinged, when I get punched in the face metaphorically. And so the way that you just broke that down, hopefully, are the ingredients that someone can now take, make their own dish, but actually start to live that life that they want, right? That they don't allow rejection as the thing that holds them back, that they don't dismiss themselves of what they're freaking capable of by looking at some, maybe somebody like you and going, well, I can't be as good as Jamie Kern Lima. And that's why I wanted to start the interview exactly how I started it, because I think that it is a beautiful way to see what is possible. And the fact that in this whole interview, you've broken down how that was possible mm is now honestly the biggest gift I think you can give people. And to your point, you know, this is why I show up as well, is that if we can 
allow people, like I'm still learning. I still learn from you. I still learn from the book. Like I always want to keep growing. And if we can help people have that mentality, that it doesn't mean that you're a failure, that it doesn't mean that you're worthless, that it doesn't mean fill in the blank. Now, can you imagine what's possible? Okay. I cannot sit here as your friend and hear you say you do not think you are special. <laughs> Let me just say something, okay? There's a whole chapter in Worthy called You're Not Crazy, You're Just First. And every single one of us right now, every person watching, every person listening, like there is not, whether you listening, watching right now, believe that you are made in God's image the way I do, whether you believe in the universe, whatever you believe, this is undeniably true that there is not another person in this entire universe quite like you, right? Every person watching us right now, there is no one else in existence with your unique fing fingerprints, with the unique iris in your eyes. Every single one of us has a unique tongue print. We actually have a unique heartbeat. Mm -hmm. There is no one else in existence that has the same emotions you have, the same feelings, the same thoughts, the same experiences. You are so undeniably special. You can't even argue it no matter what you believe. You cannot argue it. And here's, here's the thing that, that I would love to leave everyone with. When you are brave enough to show up in this world as who you are, all of who you are, by definition, you're first. There's never been another you before. They will, there will never be another you again. And when you show up as who you authentically are, you're first. So don't be surprised if not everyone gets it and not everyone gets you. Don't be surprised if you don't feel like you belong sometimes. Don't be surprised if you feel like there's things that are odd or quirky or different or unique or wrong with you. It's because you're first. And there are a lot of people that will not show up as who they authentically are. But when you show up and say what you mean and, 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 and be who you are, you are first. There's never been another you in the whole universe. And when I realized this in my life, because so much of my life I felt like I didn't fit in or I didn't belong, and I had this huge moment where I realized, oh, and my family had had these big dreams and they used to call me words like crazy or this or mm -hmm. that. And I realized, I'm not crazy. I'm just first. And for every person watching us right now, when you are brave enough to be who you truly are, you are undeniably special. And also you're first. You're not crazy. You're just first, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and the first ever you. And the things we think so often are what's quirky or wrong with us are actually the greatest things right with us. They're the greatest things right with us, right? And when we learn to embrace that we're first, it can change everything because it's that tool right? That this idea, you're not crazy, you're just first. It's this tool that just gives you this power to show up more as who you authentically are in every moment. And every time you do that, you tell yourself you are worthy of doing it. And that is how you rise your self-worth one step at a time. Um, where can people find you and the amazing book, Worthy? So Worthy is, uh, it's out in the world. I'm so excited. Yes. It's out. And it's at worthybook.com. You can grab it anywhere books are sold. Target, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, there's a lot of exciting just thank you gifts at worthybook.com. And I'm donating 100% of the proceeds from the book. If you're feeling stuck or trapped in life, then keep watching so that you can actually change everything. There's also something about, let's say you want to do something and those in your life do not support you doing it and you're going to do it anyway. When you come out the other end, I'm gonna tell you right now, that kind of confidence is unshakable. Mm. I have done things in my business that I thought I could absolutely never do and it gives me the confidence to go through new things that are very scary to me. So you won't even recognize yourself. If you are, God forbid, if you get into a situation that you wanna do something, your spouse does not support it, you do it anyway and there's friction for a while, but you will come out the other end as long as you don't give up you will not be the same woman mm. at all and you will just be a better version of yourself. So there is a silver lining when you don't get the support because you are more mm. are just like a tiger. Like I'm gonna prove everyone wrong. Sometimes we need some of that energy. So there could be some good that comes of it, but dang, it's rocky in the middle. I totally get that. Yeah, and that's why I really appreciated the fact that you 
Like, it was one of those moments where when I read it, you're like, just don't tell him. I was like, oh my gosh, she said okay. it. I sat there. I remember <laughs> writing the chapter and I sat Dude. there like, I cannot say that. I cannot. And it was hard for me because I had a husband who supported me what? on day one. What? So I wasn't even in that situation. But I looked at my students. So many of the women in mm. my my community do not have supported spouse, supportive spouses, unfortunately. And I think of them and I think of Emily and Jane and San, Sammy and I think, they did it anyway. I know it can be done and their lives are better for it. And their kids see their moms crush it. Oh. There's something big. Even though you and I don't have our own children, we know how powerful that mm -hmm. is to have these, especially I have um, a gal on my team. Her name is Jaws. It's a nickname, but we love Jaws. And her, she just became my CEO. And her little girl, Sienna, who's two, said, Mommy, you're a CEO. And she said, I am. And she said, can Sienna be a CEO? She's like, yes. That's the stuff I live for when the kids see their moms doing big things. Yeah. And so thank you for that. And then putting it in the book was so eye-opening and um, just very honest. Because I do think about these pivotal moments in our lives. And there's so many of us that want to have a beautiful relationship. And so yes. I never want to shy away from talking about that. But also at the same time, what traps us? I don't, again, I'm not, never, never blaming the man, to be honest. I'm Me more neither. kind of like our choices that we make. Yes. Yes. And so in these moments where we talk about, especially these days, where it's like, you can be your own boss. You can freaking step up to the plate, homie. Like, you can be the damn hero of your own life. Yes. Right? But like, what are these things that trap us? It's the things that maybe we want. We want the freedom of our career and we want a beautiful relationship. And sometimes when those two may show up and in conflict, yep. a lot of us may choose the relationship. And so the fact that you laid that out, it just gives someone, almost takes off the blinders of what that, knock-on effect could look like. It, yes, it could literally be the difference between your ultimate happiness or not. Yeah. Because what, you're gonna stay in a relationship and not go after your dreams. Where is the happiness going to come from that? So I absolutely agree. And I love that you've touched on something a few times that I'm so glad you did. It's not the man. Mm. I love men. Mm. I love working with men. Uh, Tony Robbins was great to me. I have a good relationship now with my dad. It took a little while. And I've had some other great male bosses. And my business partner that I got out of the partnership with, he was incredibly strategic and smart. The common denominator of all of those was me not being confident in myself, me thinking that he was going to save the day. And I think it came down to, I was so afraid of what if it doesn't work? So I was looking to a man to save me because in the back of my mind, I'm like, this isn't gonna work. And then what's behind, what if this doesn't work is what will people think? So I think if you sum up my whole experience as a corporate girl into entrepreneurship, the biggest fear that has been a through line is, what will people think if I fail or if I crash and burn? I still deal with that today, 14 years in. It's in the back of my mind when I try new things and do new things, like even putting this book out there. What if it's not the success that I think it could be? What will people think of me? But here I am, I wrote the book, I'm promoting it, I'm on your show, because even if they think, oh my gosh, she's a loser, um, the people that have opinions about your business, but they're not in your business, they're not paying the bills, they don't get an opinion mm. on what you do. So I had to stop letting people have opinions when I don't even know who they are, they're strangers <laughs> on the internet. So anyway, this whole idea of what will people think comes down to just being so scared that you're not enough. And, and, and I know your show really taps into helping women realize their worth no matter what. Mm -hmm. You exist, you are worthy, period. Fuck yeah, girl. Yeah. Um, how the hell then did you pivot by going, you said earlier, right? I was a person that absolutely was, was seeking validation. Oh, always. In the corporate world to being the person now that can write a book going, I don't know if it's gonna work, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Yes. Like this is the juice right here, girl. Yes. What are the, the key things that people, that you've adopted to allow yourself to go from that to where you are now? Okay, the biggest thing was taking action it not working and getting back up. That is the only reason I have so much confidence in what I do. I believe I can do anything. I believe I can figure anything out in my business. That's a very big statement to say from a girl that was terrified to go out on her own, uh, hated getting on video. I, <laughs> in the early years, I never got on video. It was terrifying, <laughs> cared deeply about what everybody thinks. But what I did is I got very clear on my why. Remember, I didn't want a boss. I wanted lifestyle freedom more than anything. And so every time I did 
something and it didn't work. Like one of my first launches, like when I started my own business, I made $267. I thought I was going to make a hundred thousand bucks. So yeah, I literally thought it was going to be a hundred thousand dollar launch. It was 267 bucks. It was huge failure. And so I had all the emotions, all the fears. What if I have to go grovel back for my job? I went through all of it Mm. for about a week. And then luckily my sweet husband's like, we got to get this together. You need to shower. You need to pull yourself (laughs) together. This isn't a good look for you. And so it was getting back up. And the next launch I did, I think I made $10,000. It wasn't like millions or anything, but it's, it's proving to yourself that you can get back up when you get knocked down is the only way I know to find confidence. It literally, that has been it for me. And I know for much of your story as well, like crashing and burning and getting back up. Like literally, if people could honestly really hear that, go. When people say, what is your superpower? I yeah. say, it's getting back up. I love I that. I all the time. Yes. I mess up. I'm incompetent most of the time. I'm Same. insecure. I'm, like, so when you think about all of these things and yet I still have achieved what I've achieved, the truth is, is that when I get punched in the face, I heal the wound and then, I mean, obviously yes. metaphorically, and I just go, okay, make sure next time you look out for that right hook. Yes, like let's not do that again. And you might feel embarrassed. You might feel like so frustrated. Feelings aren't going to kill you. And that's another thing. You just gotta feel it and then just be like, what's next? And I always say, what's next is better. So when a door gets closed for me, when something doesn't work out, I've 2021 was a year in business that I did not like. I left and right things were not working out for me and i in my mind i kept saying what's next is better 2022 was an amazing year because i believed that it was coming i really did know that so i think it's so important that i love that's your superpower i get back up you cannot lose you cannot lose with that superpower yeah and anyone can harness a superpower like that and and there's the element of when i tell myself i'm not good enough i don't hold my identity to it Right? I hold my identity to being the person that gets back up. So every time I fail, if someone was to, which used to be the fear, right? Everyone would mock me. Yes. That would be the fear. Like, oh, see, I told you you wouldn't be able to uh, do it. Or the people you knew in the past at your like old job, especially yes. having Quest under my belt. Mm. So like going from Quest now being in front of the camera, it's like, well, what if, what if I tank? What if I don't do well? And that narrative is precisely the thing that can end up holding ourselves back. But if I go, will I fail? But did you learn from it? Yes, amazing. Now I don't, I keep leaning into trying the things. Um, And this validation piece, like you were saying, being able to say I was the person that used to absolutely pride myself on being the person that was getting the pat on the back. And now you saying where you are now in approaching your book with fear, I think is beautiful because people need to hear that. And when you need that moment of jolt forward, if you're scared, if you're worried, what if I fail? Being able to say, well, Amy tried it with her book. So if Amy tried it, you said it earlier, right? If someone else can do it, then so can I. Amen. Look for proof everywhere. There is proof that you can fail. There's proof that you can succeed. It is everywhere, whatever you want it to look like. Yeah. So I'm just constantly looking at like, oh, she did it. Okay, I can do it. Oh, look what I did. I took this baby step. I could take a bigger step. Look for the proof. Yeah, I love that. And then one other thing that literally made me laugh out loud in your book was when you said, you're not for everyone, boo. Oh, geez. The, I, this was a hard lesson for me to learn. So when I first started to put myself out there, it was very vanilla. I wouldn't really put a stake in the ground either way. And then I realized I'm going to get lost in the sea of online craziness, Mm. right? I've got to be known for something. I've got to put my opinions out there. So I started to be more vocal. And then there's this one guy online that he's like, you are wrong about that marketing strategy or something. And then other people chimed in and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going down. I think it was three people. But in my mind, <laughs> oh three million people in came after me. It sounds like there's like hundreds of thousands I know. of people. I think it was three you. people. And so I called up my good friend Jasmine and I said, oh my gosh, I'm getting attacked online. I'm so nervous. Should I delete the comments? What do I do? Which you never delete the comments. And I've learned that. And she right away, she's like, you're not for everyone, boo. Like, you're not Santa Claus. Everyone doesn't love you or is going to. Like, that's not how the world works. And it was the best lesson I ever got because I don't like everyone. So why do I think everyone's going to like me? But I had to learn that early on because when you try to please everyone and no matter what you're doing, you will literally water down your message so much Mm. that you won't even recognize yourself. Yeah. Um, What about if the thing that is holding you back is you yourself? You talk about very eloquently about self-sabotage and so many of us do it without even acknowledging or realizing that we actually self-sabotage. 
I do it all the time, actually. I still do it to today, but I catch it faster. That's the beauty of experience. You're still gonna have the mistakes, you're gonna have the fear, you're gonna have all the feelings, but you catch it faster and you bounce back. And with this one, I still see it come up, but I could bounce back. And here's what it looks like for me. Can you explain the yes. definition of self-sabotage yes. as well? I love so this. With, with the idea of self-sabotage is that you do something great, you have an accomplishment, you win in one way or another, and you instantly think it's either gonna be taken away or you don't deserve it or it was a fluke or something's gonna happen. And this used to happen to me all the time. I remember my first $30,000 launch, which feels like so much money. I'd never seen that much money in a short period of time in my life. I made $30,000. I remember telling my husband, it was so exciting. And the next thought was something bad's gonna happen. I, I just had something really good happen to me. The other shoe's going to drop. This was so normal in my head. And what it comes down to is I did not believe I was worthy of that success. So when you see yourself sabotaging, believing that it, you don't deserve it, it's gonna go away, it was a fluke, anything like that, it is about your worthiness. Mm. Because I know that you've worked a lot on your worthiness and I know you believe you are worthy of greatness. When good things happen to you now, are you able to sit in that greatness and, and feel it? Oh, that's a good question. I think only if I've earned it. Like Ooh, if something- what's that about? When would you not earn it? Oh, I think there's many times that something is just like, comes to you like as a gift or like oh and i'm like but i didn't do anything to get this and i think that comes to the the, the um what is it participation trophy yes hell no you're not any part I of that i do not want a participation <laughs> trophy in fact i want to sign it around my neck that says loser just so it stings enough that i learned my lesson hey, you are <laughs> so funny like that but if you do what whatever works for you right exactly now look of course there were moments that if i was very sensitive i wouldn't put the sign around because i understand that would now become detrimental to my self-esteem so right. i like to joke but that i know myself well enough to know you can't go down this path I have taught myself to pride myself on things, to work hard and go from zero to a hundred. Mm. That I've done the work. And I think that helps me so that I don't expect great things. Just because I've had one success oh. doesn't mean that I deserve another success. Have I worked for it? And so part of me is I have to look at if I've earned it or not. And that's a big thing for me. Okay. Okay, so that makes sense. This this idea that if you've earned it, then you're going to feel really good in it. And I can get behind that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think a lot of the times something good will happen to us. We're showing up, we're making it happen. We get this thing and then we think like the other shoe's going to drop yeah. because we make some kind of reason in our head why we didn't deserve it or maybe we didn't work hard enough. And we have to catch those really quickly because the, long, the quicker you can catch it, the less it's going to happen because if you don't believe you deserve it, I can promise you that you're going to find a way that it's going to get taken away. Mm. It, you know, like you're going to do something that will counteract this goodness that happened. So nowadays, when something really good happens, I first make myself feel the feelings. Like, let's sit in this before we go and do something else. Let's celebrate. Let's feel it. Let's acknowledge it. And then let's look at how I got here to prove to myself, oh, no, I deserve every single bit of this. Let's do more. I have a good friend that always says to the universe, more please, and I love that. It's like, instead of thinking you're gonna get it taken away, she's like, no, I, I, I receive that and I would like more of that, please. I would like to be doing more of that. Oh God, that's a really great way of people to approach things in these moments. As you were talking, I was like, what is it about us? If we achieve something great, we're like, it's been a fluke, it yeah. was given to me. But when something crappy happens, we go, see, I oh, knew I was no good. So true. What the hell is that about? I know, and I think that's with more women than men. Yes, like, agreed. When I'm around guys and they do a good job, they take all the credit for it. <laughs> They're like, yes, and I hung the moon. Like, <laughs> if I could have an ounce of that, right? Like, they are really good at just owning it. Most men are. With women, you're right. It's like, oh, that was a fluke or this might get taken away and then hitting on. But when something bad happens, I could beat myself up for that for, for weeks yeah. around it. And that's another thing about playing small. You you beat mm. yourself up, you, you go down this rabbit hole, you're not good enough. Look, you always mess it up, whatever it is. I have to catch that really fast mm. as well. So when I see the spiral, I'm like, no, 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 that didn't work. Let's go for something else. I have a good friend who says every decision she makes, she does not classify it as good or bad. Mm. She doesn't put those labels on it. She said, I made a decision 
And based on that decision, I made another decision, whether to keep going or go a different route. Mm -hmm. And I love taking the stigma out of, am I good, am I bad? No, I'm just making decisions because that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And then you can learn from those decisions. Yeah. But if you say you're bad, then you start to feel a certain way. Exactly. So let's stop putting uh, labels on the decisions we're making. As uh, anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur, you have to make decisions every single day. So let's just say we're making decisions. We're taking that label off and depending on where that leads us, we're making a new decision. Mm -hmm. Done. I love that. One of the things that I've also used in these moments that I realized is when things are really bad, it feels like it's gonna be like that forever. Forever. And I think that yes. that's the point of when something good happens, we know it won't last. Yes. And so we have this like thing where, um, it almost comes into conflict. The thing that we really love, we're so fearful that we don't get to enjoy it because we know it's gonna be uh, you know, momentary and the yes. things we freaking hate, we somehow convince ourselves it's gonna be like that forever. Right. And so the thing that, you know, the, the wise old saying, this too shall pass, I use it for great things as well. Ooh. And it isn't to make me feel bad. It is to remind myself that I, I shouldn't expect to live here always. Why do I think that when I succeed, when I have these great moments, that that should be my baseline? It's true. It, I, I love that you bring this up. It's not always good. No. It's not always gonna be there. So if you're able to be in the suck as well as the good times, if you're able to just to be present, again, you cannot lose. That mm -hmm. is playing the game. That is playing big when you're just here for it all. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I never thought about thinking like when it's really good, like this too shall pass, it feels kind of sad but it's the reality yeah and that's the funny thing when i first thought about it i was like oh that's kind of sad and i was like actually it's not i have now lent into the idea that this is so beautiful and they're not always going to come around and so just enjoy it right now yeah. because it's going to pass yes instead of worrying oh my god this isn't going to last i almost go this isn't going to last yes yeah, I, I know it now so i'm just going to be very present mm -hmm. when it does mm -hmm. I think, you know, when I wrote Two Weeks Notice, the, the number one goal was to help women realize that there literally is another way out there yeah. if they want it. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to talk about these really important mindset shifts, they literally help women see, wait a second, there's another way for me to do life if I want it. Mm -hmm. If I'm stuck, if I'm frustrated, if I'm not loving where I'm at right now, there is an absolutely different way to do it. I didn't know that for so long. When I was in my nine to five job, until I tell the story at the very beginning of the book, there was like one fateful meeting that changed my life. Without that meeting, I didn't know there was a whole other life where I got to call the shots. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about uh, who I wanna serve, it's these women that might not know, oh my gosh, come on in. Like, let us show you that you can literally create a life by your own design. You, Every woman has that capacity. Do you mind sharing that story? Because I think it's super powerful. Okay, so here's what happened. So I was working for Tony Robbins almost seven years as a director of content development. That means like I got to travel the world with Tony and the team and work on this amazing content at his events. So I had a really good job. I got paid well and I got to do cool things. And then one day I was called into a meeting in San Diego and it was this big oak table and all these internet marketers, like uh, business owners were there, all men. And they were in all different walks of life from relationships to investing to real estate, so many different niches. I was called to the meeting to take notes. So I was sitting at a side table, yeah, very humbling. I was sitting at a side table taking notes and Tony, what I love about him is he does his research and he learns from people that are doing amazing things. So he said, all right guys, tell me about your businesses. Let me know how you're doing this online marketing thing because he wanted to do more of it. Mm -hmm. And so they went around the table and all I heard was freedom. They got to pick their kids up from school at a certain time. They went on wonderful vacations. They called the shots. They had creative freedom, financial freedom. And I just thought, I don't know what these guys are doing, but I have never had freedom like that in my life. Mm. And it was that one moment. I never thought about being an entrepreneur. I never thought about having my own business. And, and what's so crazy is not one woman was represented at that table at the time. Now I think if Tony did it again, there'd be badass women. But many, many years ago, not many women were doing what we're doing today. Mm. And so I thought, I don't see myself at this table, but something inside me tells me there's a different world. And that was my first introduction that there literally is a different life I can create. And that's when I became passionate about helping other women. That's literally why I wrote the book. 
I love yeah. this story so much because you had actually said it right at the beginning of the interview where you're like, see someone that's doing it, that gives you the encouragement. Yes. But when you don't see it, it takes, I'm just going to be crude a little, it takes freaking balls. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. It does. And then I think about women of color where, uh, you know, men make more money than women in, in the in nine to five world. White women make more money than women of color. Women of color make less money. So they're not even seeing themselves mm. in some of the women. Like it's really important that we see ourselves in other people. And so if if this book gets more women, uh, women of all walks of life into entrepreneurship, I want that so bad. So these young women can see themselves in so many different ways. So it makes a huge difference. Hell yeah, because your book is so beautifully tactical on how to build your business, what yeah. to look at, how to hold yourself accountable. And so that's why this episode, I really wanted to talk about the things that hold us back yes. from even trying, yeah. from even getting started. Because if you're not seeing people out there that are like you, if you've been told your whole life, you're not good enough, what on earth is going to give you the encouragement to get freaking started in the first place? Amen. So I think, you know, the bulk of the book is how to start a business from scratch. But the most important part of the book is the stuff we're talking yeah. about, like actually finding the courage. And notice I say courage and not confidence. I believe that courage comes way before confidence ever comes. And a lot of women aren't starting something new because they said, I, I'm not confident enough. Mm. No one has confidence in the beginning. Confidence is, oh, I have a track record, so I have proof that this is going to work. Mm. Courage is, I have no idea, but I want it bad enough. So this book is about helping women find the courage first because we are not waiting for the confidence. Sometimes it doesn't come for many, many years. And even the word courage though, I love the word. I do too. And so yeah. I'm, I'm so, I find that words matter. Absolutely. I lean into them. I put a severe meaning behind them. Yes. And so courage. It makes me feel good about yeah. myself. And when someone else and I go, ah, oh, they were courageous. I want to be courageous. Yes. What does courageous look like? What does that look like? Yeah, and like even just saying the words, like repeating the word over and over. I'm like, I really like this word. I want to be courageous. And now you can even see I've embodied a different spirit Absolutely. by just saying the freaking word. Absolutely. But you ask a great question. I think every one of us should ask, what does courage look like for me? Mm. Like if I'm going to be mm. courageous, what does that look like? What would I do? So anyone listening right now or watching, ask yourself, like, when was the last time you did something really courageous? I mean, shaking in your boots kind of courageous. I think we need to do more of that because it gets easier. The more you do crazy things, the easier it is to kind of put yourself out there. I love that. Yeah. Um, the thing that you've noticed that really holds us back is the gratitude piece, where you know if you're making a change in your life, for you, you had a great nine to five, you're getting pats on the back, you're working up the corporate ladder. Um, and so as you start to think, well, maybe is this really the life I want? I want to pivot, I want to change, I'm going to go back to zero. What was yeah, the capacity phrase? For capacity zero. for zero. Yeah. Um, and you have other people that are like, yeah, but you should be grateful. Like you're uh, earning money. You've got a roof over your head. Like, are you okay. not grateful? And the gratitude piece keeps so many of us stuck. Yes. I, I, I we don't talk about this enough. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. It's this idea that you should be glad ex from where you're at right now. Yeah. This is a good life and it could be a good life. I had a really good job mm -hmm. and it was very exciting. But I also knew there is more for me. I'm done playing small. And so you have to, you can be grateful, but also want more. You can be grateful and say, I'm so glad this happened in my life. This was a beautiful chapter. Like my, my nine to five was a beautiful chapter and I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be there. So you can have the best of both worlds, but just being grateful for something doesn't mean you have to stay there. Yeah, it, it's become like, I call it almost like toxic gratitude now. Very much so. Because yes. it really does make you feel bad about asking for more. And I think to your point, you can be absolutely grateful that you've got a beautiful husband, a great yes. relationship, and and at the same time, I want more in my career. I want more yes. in my finances. I want more in X, Y, and Z. And this is something I think we just have to like keep hammering home and like yes. breaking the idea for women that where you are right now, like let's say for instance with kids, right? It's like, well, you should be grateful you're able to have a child. Totally. And it's like, 
So that means I shouldn't want five children or that means that I shouldn't want kids and a career. Like it ends up holding us back from thinking that we're asking for too much. And then that becomes a narrative, especially for women that we take with us, that women ask for too much. Oh, and that is like, that, that fires me up right there. I think we're not asking for enough. Yes. I think that we need to put it out there. You know, putting this book out into the world I didn't realize I had to ask for so many favors. So this is actually very appropriate in the sense of, I have to ask people, can I come on your show? Can I do this? Can I do that? And some people have said no. And that's like, I have to practice what I preach. Okay, what's next is better. But I realized I struggled asking for favors and asking for what I wanted. And for many months leading up to this, mm -hmm. I didn't do it. And people on my team would be like, have you called this person? Have you done that? And I'm like, oh, I just, I don't want to. And I asked myself, why am I so afraid to ask for what I want? And it comes back to, because what if they don't think that I'm good enough to have it? And again, I have to catch myself. So I think it's important to have these conversations to say, you and I have been in the game for a long time. We still deal with the stuff that we dealt with on day one of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. We just can navigate it in such a different way now. It just comes with time and experience. So stop beating yourself up if you don't know how to navigate this in the beginning. Nobody does. And so you just have to get in the game. I think if I titled the book anything else, it would be get in the game. Like, let's stop uh, playing small. <laughs> let's get in the game. I love that. Um, how have you dealt with rejection then recently with people? Because... I want to be very honest. I'm always trying to be extremely honest and transparent yeah. with my audience. And even now, as an adult with what we've done, getting rejected right now, still freaking stings. I still have to process it. I still have to like Same. emotionally equalize. So how do you actually handle that? Especially when it's someone maybe that you've trusted or yeah. maybe that you've considered like has your back. True. So I've had a few instances like that. And you're right, I've had to take a moment and let it sting. Like, ooh, that one hurts. Mm -hmm. And typically I'll go to my husband or a good girlfriend and say, can we talk this out a minute? And so I'll have to say like, I'm feeling this way and I don't think it's fair that they did this or I'm so hurt that they, I just have to have that moment. Okay, so I the think, venting. Yes, I have to vent, I gotta talk it out. Mm -hmm. And then once I do, I have to remind myself that it's, everything is not about me. This is a lesson I've learned in entrepreneurship for many, many years where someone might've said no to me, but I have no idea if that's about me or about them. They might have something else going on. They might have an issue with me based on their own issues with themselves. I have no clue. Mm. It's the story you make up in your head mm. that's gonna determine everything, right? Everything's a perspective, a story. So what I've learned is I need to choose a different story. So that stung, what if they don't like me or what is it about me? No, no, I'm gonna make up a different story that's going to serve me. I have no idea what's going on in their life right now. I wish them well. What's next is better. I literally choose a different story. That's way more gracious than me. <laughs> what do you do? Because you so, get over it. So what yeah. do you do? Oh, okay. So I've got these, I almost have these different buckets. Okay. So I process like you. Okay. Okay. I've reached out. They've said no. Is this about me? Yes. Okay. Maybe it's not about me, but let's say they've said no because they don't think I'm going to do well for their channel. Let's yes. just say, right? And now it's like, well, it's their yeah, business. You don't know for sure. No, but let's okay. just say. Okay. So I reach out to someone. This actually happened okay. to me. About four years ago, this person was huge. Okay. They had a catastrophic thing happen to them. They reached out to us and Tom agreed to have them on his show okay. to support their new venture. Okay. Now, we didn't think they were going to do well. It was like, it was just support your homie. Okay. That that's it. This person means a lot to you. Support them. So we have them on the show. They then catapult into um huge stardom okay bigger than they were okay i reach out to them six months ago i'm already mad yeah i'm oh, already yeah. mad what's coming yeah yes. i reach out to them about six months the first favor we've ever asked in four years and they said no now in that moment my husband who is very emotionally sober goes yeah but baby you may not be good for his channel like for him that was like no big oh, deal tom was so right like, but if you're bad for his channel why would he have you on and in that reply, I said, you have your friend's backs. Like I have, and look, that doesn't mean that someone else is bad. You even said earlier, it's not good or bad. It's just a value system. And this is where I had to work through it. I have a value system that says, when someone has been there for you, you show up for them. If that means an episode fucking tanks, an episode fucking tanks. Yes. But you, what is your priority? What do you value more? Now, here's the caveat. I understand that this may make me a worse businesswoman. I understand 
I have to be honest with myself. If I was on their channel and did bad, yeah. versus not on their channel and not tank their episode, from a business standpoint, okay. I can go. It's better for them from a business standpoint, they don't have me on. But my value system says, even if that was true, if, I've, if someone's had my back, you show up for them. So now I go, I've got a different value system to I was them. gonna say, so it's, you just have a different value system. But, now here's the other thing, I'll never do that for them again. And I think You've burnt that's your bridge. Okay. You're in my black book. Yes. Like I was going to say, you have a different value system and now you have to decide, are you going to separate yourself from that person now? They do not get an opinion. They don't get a vote anymore. Yes. And that's your prerogative. And I think that's a lot of growth right there to say, I'm going to own this. Like they might think something totally different, but this is my value system. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to navigate this way. That I think is really powerful. Yeah. Did it feel good when you finally got to the point that you're like, okay, but screw that. If they ever come back to me, I'm done. Um, Did you get to a place of peace? So yes, until they came back to us. Oh geez. <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming even more complicated, right? And here's then the difference between me and my husband. My husband being my business partner isn't an emotional human when it comes to business. So this opportunity comes, he comes to me, he's like, what do you think? I said, fuck no, mate. <laughs> and he's like, as your business partner, I respect you. But as your business partner, I'm telling you, you're making a wrong business decision. Ooh. And I had to emotionally um, equalize, hear what he said, take it for truth. Okay. And yet still be confident in my decision that I'm the type of person that will show up for my friends. And if you don't show up for me, if I ever reach out, I just know who you are. Yes. Okay, so while I was watching you kind of go through that, it was so interesting, all the different aspects, I realized, the thing I love about entrepreneurship the most is that we each individually get to call the shots. Aww. So sometimes when my business is not going as well as I want and I'm complaining to my husband or I'm frustrated with somebody or whatever, he always teasingly says like, you should talk to your boss about that. Meaning like, oh, I do get to call the shots. I can work with who I want and I can say no to who I don't want to work with. That does not happen in the nine to five world. You don't always get to choose the relationships and navigate them how you want. You do though, like you can decide never to work with that person again and no one else gets a say. I mean, Tom does, of course, but if you guys work out that together. Yeah, we have a respect. Very much. If you show that card where you're like, this is, this is important to me, yeah, this is not that's okay. The word we use yes, and I love even. that kind of respect and love. Yeah. So again, being an entrepreneur means you call the shots. You create the life and the business that you want on your terms. Mm. There's nothing else like that in this world, I think. I think that's what makes it so special. You call the shots. Just like you with your book, right? You even admit that you were scared to write a book. You have that like imposter syndrome, yep. if you will, that who am I to write a book? Is anyone actually gonna like it? But you still got the deal. You still wrote the book. You put it out there without any guarantee without any guarantee. And I think it comes down to what matters most to me, a, a book that gets all the accolades or a book that literally, even what if it just changed one woman's life? I mean, I really do believe in the value of one life like that. And so I just have to believe, I know it's gonna change many women's mm -hmm. lives. I need to focus more on that than all the ego that could get tied up in this. Yeah. So that's been a really beautiful lesson, hard lesson for me to learn along the way. Join the Bad Witch Club and master your confidence right now by clicking here. A lot of people stay in quiet desperation because they get talked out of the thing that deep down inside they know to be true. And they're going to think, what's wrong with you? Like, aren't you grateful enough? Why would you leave? So.